Hello everyone and welcome to the Green Falls High School podcast, first edition uh, by myself, Alex McGregor, and alongside me is your president of the Pupil Parliament, Daniel Cruden. Hi everyone, it's good to be here for um, hosting the first podcast of the year. So um, first of all, we have to talk about UNCRC's Article 17, which states that children and young people should be able to access information, particularly from the media. So this podcast is going to help with that. Obviously, you'll have different hosts all the time, but we will be here to demonstrate different uh, news and anything going around school to you through this podcast. Since this podcast, this episode of the podcast in particular, is focused on COP26 and the news around that uh, in recent times, we'd also like to give a quick mention to Article 29 of the Rights of the Child, and that is that education must encourage the children's the child's respect for human rights and the environment around them. And with COP26 week last week, we've seen a few changes around the school. We've seen a cut down on disposable masks and there was obviously S5 and S6, the winners of the mask competition. Yeah. Um, they had the most reusable masks over the week. We also had um, our pledges. Yeah, of course, we've seen that around the school. That most people's putting their pledges towards uh, how to reduce their carbon footprint. So that's a big improvement, guys. Um, definitely beneficial. So if people can keep that up. That'd be fantastic, I guess. I'm sure all the teachers would be impressed by that. We'd also like to give a big thank you to Minuteman Press Printers in Edinburgh. Um, they helped with a donation of our posters. And obviously, if you've seen them around the school, you could see they were proper good tier po- uh, posters. So, yeah, with um, the work of Joel Fosahini as well. Yeah, he obviously helped design them. So uh, thank you. And um, if you ever need any printing, you should definitely go check them out. Yeah, good quality posters, guys. Um, so thank you, Minuteman Press Printers, Edinburgh. Um, so within this podcast, I'm sure there'll be some areas that interest yourselves. Uh, first up, we have a catch up with your captains, Taylor and Haley. Um, so just uh, get to know them a bit better. Uh, followed by that, we have an interview with Miss Miko, held by Argyle Barkley and Fraser Baxter. Next, um, after that, we'll have. Argyle Barkley again and Callum Tate going into Glasgow to interview some of the protesters at COP26 and I've been told there's a few interesting takes on what they had to say. Oh, I'd so quite like to hear this Daniel. It'd be quite exciting to hear what they have to say Not about that. This one yet. Especially with uh, Argyle being so opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have some study tips here from different teachers around the school. Um, so yeah, I hope you all enjoy the main body of the podcast and then we'll be here at the end to catch us all up. So thank you and enjoy. Right, so it was Climate Action Week this week. Mm-hmm. We've seen people stop using, well, attempt to stop using uh, one-time masks because mm-hmm. that's not exactly good, is it? Yeah, true. And then the tannery announcements that's shown the year groups which are doing the best at it mm. so far it's been fifth and sixth year three times i think three times it was fourth year yesterday they fourth had a, year yesterday, they yeah. massively dropped because i think the day before they were like 87 percent yeah it's like second more first year second year that i think is the last yeah right. we'll see what happens today we'll get the announcement on monday and then we'll yeah, find we'll see out how it goes from there meatless monday as well how yeah meatless go? monday was good uh, i think those Quite a lot of people who went for it. I think there was quite big lines in lunch hall. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that was a bit of a hit. Last week we had the uh, Science the Girls thing, which I think that was a really good way of like showing the school support for the Yeah, there's a lot of awareness for it because a lot of people had masks on, especially quite a lot of the girls. I think that was a good success, that one. Mm-hmm. And then what have we got coming up? Coming up we've got the quiz night and we've got the first parliament meeting so the quiz night is today's money for the prom and yearbooks the fifth and sixth years that are going and the teachers and yeah and then after that we've got the first the first in-person parliament meeting mm-hmm. which will help us decide our parliamentary, parliamentary cause mm-hmm. all, I think it was last week all parliamentary campaigns were put forward by everyone which was really good see everyone speaking on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, discussions were done quite well, there was loads of questions asked. So yeah, I think that went well. Mm-hmm. And then we've got all the committees doing their own part. 
So we've got the the social justice lot they're going into the soup kitchens yeah they've been going to the soup kitchens and then i can't remember when it is but i feel like it's 26 and they're doing the sleep out it's the i think 19th oh the 19th right okay. and we're gonna have people sleeping in the middle of the track Mm-hmm. To uh, show support. Football for, pitch as well, I think. Is it football pitch as well? I don't know, just because it's like a wee bit cornered off for people. Ah, uh, okay. So I'm not too sure about that one. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, it's the 50th anniversary of the school. Mm-hmm. Well, that's mental, the fact it's... I know we've not only moved into Dublin recently, but it's mental, I think, we've been... We've been, been 50 years 50, off the school. I know. Like my dad could went this year. <laughs> Um, dad did go to this school. Um, yeah, so we're heading towards the right school respecting award, is mm-hmm. it? Yeah. yeah, right. I think uh, we're going to see if we can get that in around February or March next year. Yeah. If we do, we'll, we'll manage to be the first school in Lanarkshire to pull that off. Yeah, which would be really 50th anniversary. So. And I know, is there not quite a few schools that are heading towards it as well? So yeah, so get we, we, we want to be the first. first. So there's a bit of competition on that. Um, I just the uh, there's COP going on obviously this week. Mm-hmm. So that's we're obviously trying to support that. Um, I know I've got people speaking to various different people. I think I have to speak to a politician. I know uh, Argyle, Ar- Argyle and Callum Tate are currently out speaking to protesters, mm-hmm. which will you'll probably hear coming up after this. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, and then the equal committees to call it too. So, like the meatless Monday, they've been saying to use the reusable masks and all that, and then they've been saying about the carpool karaoke as well. Mm-hmm. I've not seen many people do that. Nah, there's not. I don't think there's a lot of people. But maybe it. I think I think there was a there's going to be a big push at the end of the week. Yeah, so. at the end of the week. I think I've been taking a few people, but not like every day. Mm-hmm. So. It's just been me and my brothers on my part, but I'm sure yeah. other people will be participating. Yeah, I've took a few people. Like I've had like a full car nearly every day, mm-hmm. so that's been fine. I think that's all. I think I said we'll we've got prelims next. Yeah, we've next got a month. lot of other stuff coming up. Yeah, so I think it's been quite quiet at the start of the year. Mm-hmm. So hopefully. We'll see what happens. Um, prelims next month, so not much will be on. But after that, we'll get back to doing loads of events and stuff. Yeah. So I think that's all. Yeah, that's it. Hi. Uh, welcome Hello. to the Good Falls uh, High School podcast. Uh, we'd like to have you on the podcast. Uh, we've Thank got a few you. interesting questions for you okay. about the Eco Committee. Yeah. Uh, so our first question is, what do you hope to achieve with the Climate Emergency Action Week in school? Um, I think our overall aim of the Climate Emergency Action Week is to just raise awareness of climate change issues across the school. Um, Lots of different departments across the school have gotten involved and they're going to be delivering climate education lessons, whether it's a little starter at the start of what they would normally teach or a full lesson or even units of lessons as well, which is aimed to just raise awareness of the causes of climate change the impacts of climate change and the action we can take both individually and collectively. On top of that, as an eco-committee, we have organised a range of whole school initiatives and competitions and activities. And again, hopefully that is going to just raise awareness of what we can do individually and collectively to try to reduce carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. So do do you think that will be effective in the school? I hope so. I mean, it definitely depends on buy-in, doesn't it, Mm -hmm. from the student body and from staff and from their families. Um, So we've got a few different initiatives that would involve not just individual changes, but household changes. So I think communication is definitely very important for that. We're using all of our socials, so we've got an Instagram page and we've got a Twitter account. And we're asking other departments around the school to retweet things that we are tweeting so that the communication goes out to parents. We're also going to be sending out an email to parents about the fact that we're having Climate Emergency Action Week next week and how they can get involved in it. So we we are kind of relying on the buy-in from the pupils and also from staff as well. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Uh, What are your personal reasons for being so committed towards the climate? I think, yeah, it's just crunch time. I think um, this COP26 conference that's happening in Glasgow is being billed as the best last chance to do something about climate change. So I think the idea 
of the urgency needs to be gotten across to young people. That's why we're calling it a climate emergency action week and not just a climate action week. It is an emergency and we need to, you know, act now if we're going to have a chance of preserving the planet for future generations. So, yeah, I think that's why it's just thinking about not necessarily the here and now because we're not really living in a time where climate is a huge problem within the UK, but it will be in the future. But also, just being a global citizen, you know, it's, if it's not affecting us at the moment, it is affecting other parts of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, countries that we have strong associations with, California and Australia, for example, many of us have family that live in these areas that are, you know, suffering from droughts and wildfires and, you know, it's a threat to life. So I think we need to be very aware of our role as global citizens in the act that we can play, if you like, um, or the action that we can take against climate change. Mm-hmm. That sounds good. Um, this seems to be just the latest and quite ambitious ideas from your eco-committee. What do you have planned in the future? Beyond Climate Emergency Action yes. Week, yeah. I mean, we would be hopeful to just build on the momentum that the Climate Emergency Action Week has given us. Um, and build towards the green flag. Um, It's a very structured process and there's a lot of audits that have to be carried out. We then have to decide on targets and then we have to action those targets and then we have to measure and evaluate the progress on those targets. So it's a very long time consuming process, the actual bureaucracy of it, if you know what I mean. But I feel that we've got a really good team this year. We've got lots of senior pupils in particular who are quite committed and quite um, passionate about climate issues, I think. And yeah, we're just going to try to do all we can to possibly make footsteps towards getting the green flag. It's not likely that we'll get it this year, but if we can get a similar team next year, then possibly next year we could get the green flag. Mm -hmm. Do you think we as a school should be doing more to help reduce our carbon footprint? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the biggest thing that's in my head is waste management and recycling and litter. Um, I think the will is there within the student body to deal with the problems that we experience within both the school grounds and the wider area. Um, A real problem area outside the school grounds is Athelstane Drive where the van is. Mm -hmm. There's a huge littering problem up there and, and we do receive a lot of complaints to the school about the kind of behaviour, I suppose, and the attitudes towards litter of the young people. So it must be hard for those people who live in Athelstane Drive to have to deal with the litter problem that comes from that van every day. I think the van has to certainly take responsibility for the litter problem there, but so do we as a school and as a student body. Um, I think the main bit of feedback that I get when we talk about litter is the fact that there's not enough bins in the school, there's not enough facilities. Um, The bins are overflowing. You guys obviously have been kicked out of your common room Mm -hmm. recently because of of the litter problem that existed um, within the area that you were given as your common room. Um, And the feedback again from the students are that there wasn't enough bins. There was like one bin Mm -hmm. to serve all of you and it was overflowing and therefore what are you supposed to do? And I, I, I I sympathise with that and I think we do have to invest money in the facilities that we've got within the school, not just bins but also recycling facilities. I think pupils are very well versed in how to recycle. You know, you go to McDonald's and there's separate compartments within Mm -hmm. the bins for different parts of your meal and and at home, you know, we're very used to compartmentalising our waste and our litter, so we don't do it in school and that could save the bins from being overflowing because a lot of the plastic, for example, could be put in a separate receptacle and it could be used for recycling purposes, but we simply don't have the facilities. And I think that's something that the Pupil Parliament should definitely consider this year Mm -hmm. in terms of spending our budget. We need to upgrade massively the facilities that we've got in the school. All right, well, my last question, uh, much to your uh, (laughs) happiness, is uh, what are your thoughts on the COP26 summit and do you think that any positive action will come from it? Um, I mean, it's a huge event, it's massive and it's so exciting that it's coming to Glasgow and we're hearing about it all the time on the news at the moment. So this is the world stage, this isn't just national news, this is international news, the whole world is watching at the moment and Glasgow have a really good opportunity to 
elevate themselves, I think, as a as a destination. Um, so I think that will be in the forefront of the minds of the people who are organising it, as well as the commitments that the different countries around the world are going to make. Um, I know there's a lot of scepticism, um, perhaps you know, coming from the media, coming from people like Greta, quite rightly, who are holding the world leaders to account and, you know, sick of lip service, we need action, we, we can't just have people saying they're going to do this and they're going to do that, we need key pledges about climate change and we need to, them to deliver on the pledges that they're making. Will that happen? I'm not sure. China obviously have come out recently and the, the pledges that they've made is very similar to the Paris Agreement pledges that they made a good few years ago. So when it comes to the big countries that are the ones that are polluting um, and causing climate change, like China, like the USA, we really need them to be ambitious with their targets and unfortunately mm -hmm. I don't think they are. With the change in presidency, with Joe Biden being in charge and not Donald Trump, who is a well-known climate change denier, um, there is a wee bit more hope there, but I think profit, unfortunately, in economic development and progress is always going to be put above environmental mm -hmm. issues. And it's important that, that, current, that, that countries see the environment as currency and to place a monetary value on the environment because it does have one and I think that needs to be communicated mm -hmm. and be made clear to everyone else. Personally I think um, I, I, I agree with what you're saying that uh, economic development will be put first before uh, climate change but mm -hmm. do you think that requires a change in attitude or a change in perhaps system to rectify that? Yeah I mean 100% it needs the education that I spoke, to, spoke about a wee minute ago in terms of people recognising that there is currency, proper currency in environmental resources, that attitude needs to change massively and we need to recognise how important our environment is to, to our systems, our natural systems and therefore our economic systems which depend on those natural systems. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right there. The, the ISA, so it, this is an international socialist alternative. We hear from uh, many countries. I, we are from Israel, Palestine. Mm -hmm. We came here together with people from Belgium, from Ireland, from uh, Mexico, even. There's uh, someone from Brazil. Someone from Brazil, right? Um, and uh, we are here uh, to say that we need to organize uh, the youth, if especially we all have to take the rallies from, to take the strikes from our schools that we have already all over the world and bring it um, to rise it up a level, to, to to get it a level up, to uh, organize in the workspaces, uh, to unionize, to join in like solidarity with other movements. Uh, I, I don't know. I was really impressed with uh, you know Greta did the thing where she was like trying to convince the workers unions to join the strikes. Um, yeah. That's a really good uh, direction. Yeah, she really. But, like, did. Yeah, but basically, like you know, there's a lot of oppression under capitalism that occurs, you know, including of indigenous people, uh, sexism, uh, you know. Uh, racism, classism, all of these things are linked to each other and how we believe that we can uh, overcome sort of the capitalist system is by building alternative power sources that are built from the ground up uh, from the people themselves. So to do that, we want to organize uh, the climate movement but also the feminist movement uh, you know, fight against uh, oppression overall. Yes, I think, yeah, I think that we, like our generation, realize that it's all connected, right? It's the system. It's not spe uh, specifically just the climate uh, crisis or just the sexism or just racism. It's all together. It's the system that we have to break down. It's a capitalistic system and we have to build a strong alternative uh, of socialism uh, for it to change. And I think it's really... Yeah. Healthcare and jobs and, you know, uh, bring the control of, you know, the resources that are said there's a giant oil company and we try to resist it but we can't really do anything with a resource that we don't have any like ownership of and the minute you take away all these ownerships you put them in like the private hands of some tycoon who lives you know on his private island somewhere and we 
as a group, we have an ability to decide what to do with these resources. And obviously, in cases of, say, oil companies, we should stop oil production and move to uh, sustainable sources of energy. But doing this is also like an aspect of creating new jobs for people and not going like, okay, you know, screw the workers in the oil industry, it's all their fault as well. Most of them are just, you know, people. So that's why things like, you know, green deals and things like that are important. But they have to be in a context that actually uh, talks to the people uh, who are working and the people who are like on the, on the ground and not just, you know, coming from above saying that this is what we're going to do and then it ends up hurting people. So anyway, if you're interested, we have like a lot of very nice merch and stuff. Yeah, um, we have some t-shirts. Do you mind if we ask some questions? Yes, sure. Just, you know, we've got the questions here on the phone. All right, so... What action do you guys want to see taken immediately? What? What action do you guys want to see taken immediately? What action do what do we want taken immediately? Uh, immediately. By who? That depends who that. The world leaders that are here for COP26. Mm. Well, I don't specifically believe that they will actually do any of this, but yeah, I want them to uh, stop, you know, financing uh, the oil industries, all the fossil fuel industries in general. Uh, create a you know act- actual uh, attempt to involve people democratically in decisions, but again, I don't think that's going to happen from these people specifically. Yes. But um, yeah, I want to see a democratically organized uh, solution to the climate crisis that doesn't just involve you know people flying in private jets to talk about how their companies are going to do something, but that involves us. So stopping the fossil fuel industry, uh, reducing meat production significantly because it's also a significant factor that. You know, it's like 18% of emissions or something. Yes. Um, I think... Can? Yes. Yeah, I think... No, you have to... Like, we have to realize that that um, this crisis is, is not, like, a human in general fault, right? We always hear that. It's, uh, it's, it's not humanity specifically uh, yeah. at fault. Like, we're a virus on the planet. It's this accumulation of power that involves, like, you know, squashing every everything else for profit that contributes to this. And we don't believe that uh, we can, like they can, the leaders under the the capitalistic system can actually do something or will actually do something. We have to, uh, we the people, the middle class, the 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 students, we have to organize and um, yeah. And workers, yeah. So obviously, ideally, I would want them to create a, you know, stop all of this subsidizing of fossil fuels, actually reduce emissions in their countries, make like big plans, uh, you know, provide. But, but you know, I also want them to provide better housing for people and you know, provide healthcare. And the the issue is, is that we see all these like leaders who are sort of doing this greenwashing, especially with like uh, climate emergency declarations. Do you know about uh, Justin? You know Justin Trudeau uh, declared in 2019. They declared like a climate emergency in Canada, and at the same time they're funding this ginormous. Sorry, that's not a word. Um, this enormous, um, you know, pipeline that goes through uh, indigenous territory with the Wet'suwet'en and uh, brutally oppressing like non-violent protests. And this happens all over the world, right? Yeah. It happens in Israel right now. Yeah. So we're we're like seeing this sort of uh, two-facedness of these politicians. And that's why we don't believe that you can actually trust them, because under a system where they still rely on donations for their political campaigns, come mostly from these big uh, industries, you can't really trust these people to do anything that is accountable to the actual, you know, populace. They are accountable mostly to their business uh, associates, and it's still profitable to destroy the planet. I mean, I think people are also seeing how critical politicians are more and more, and that's why more people are taking to the streets, because they realize that, like, the adults in charge aren't fixing anything. So, uh, recently, as a result of the COP26 uh, summit, we have we seen a worldwide agreement from uh, over 40 countries to phase out the use of coal, and uh, most notably, the US, India, and China didn't sign up to this agreement. So, what's your guys' opinion on that? Uh, again, we think uh, that as long as they uh, are under this system, um, all these words are blah, 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 right? Uh, we, they can say whatever they want, but uh, we can't, uh, like, they can't, um, they, they can't stand behind their words, right? Uh, because they still have, they're still profiting from uh, from these exactly things. And specifically, uh, for instance, China's declaration of that they're going to stop, they didn't, they declared they would stop external coal production in the Belt and Road system. Specifically, that system hasn't been profitable for a while, and they, it's 
specifically a system where they have uh, they build infrastructure in countries in order to extract resources and the coal production hasn't been going well for a while so it's not like they're stopping it because they're all, all of a sudden they care about the climate they're stopping it because it's not profitable anymore and they're still continuing I internal coal production and similarly you know coal production should stop but a lot of uh, for instance where we're from they're saying they're going to phase out coal by 2026 but they're still investing massively in like oil and gas production so it doesn't really negate any sort of climate effects if you're continuing to invest in fossil fuels and it's sort of a uh, you know we needed to end coal production decades ago the fact that now in the situation we're in where we need we're past the point of where 1.5 degrees of warming is impossible according to the new IPCC reports then what we need is immediate uh, emergency emergency uh, provisions to move rapidly to a renewable uh, economy and not to have, you know, in 10 years we'll stop using coal. Good job, you know, that's not really helpful and it, the emissions won't necessarily even go down if you're investing massively in like fracking or something. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to me like a lot of hot air. This is no longer a climate conference. This is now a Global North Greenwash Festival. So what are your guys' thoughts on uh, other climate strikes that have taken place throughout the country, for example, Insulate Britain? I'm totally in favour. I think Insulate Britain is asking for something really sensible, and uh, not everyone agrees with their methods, but what sensible government would not insulate everybody's homes to reduce their bills to help them to save carbon? I mean, it's a no-brainer. Have you have you seen the videos of um, them blocking roads and uh, perhaps more sensitive topics of uh, ambulances, people needing to take their relative to hospital? What do you guys think Extinction of that? Extinction Rebellion has a very clear blue light policy. I'm a member of Extinction Rebellion and every time there's a blue light, we move aside. And I witnessed it in London. There was a completely blocked Cambridge Circus in the middle of London with a pink table and there was a fire engine. And within 30 seconds, we had melted to one side and the fire engine went through. It's it's a media lie. There is nobody who sat in an ambulance being blocked by no, we uh, Extinction but Rebellion or, sorry, Insulate Britain. They're mm -hmm. not the same thing. Uh, I think. Yeah. Uh, Rosemary. Did you have Did you have some thoughts on the question being asked? I echo everything that's been said. Uh, okay, right. Show me the question. question. More than 100% of uh, nations at the COP26 summit have uh, vowed to cut their methane emissions by 30%. Is this, is this good in your guys' favour or is it not enough? Um, it's good, but it's only talking still. And we were talking in 2015. And the nationally determined uh, conditions, the indices, people said, yes, we'll reduce carbon. Great Britain, United Kingdom has not done it. So they say it, but they don't walk the walk. They talk the talk, but not walk the walk. Mm -hmm. So um, until they do it, and Boris Johnson just comes out with wonderful words, mm -hmm. but in the budget, he um, increased pass air passenger duty, decreased it for internal mm -hmm. flights. What's yeah, that about? If that. that's, that's, that's not decarbonizing. Mm -hmm. He could have started 10 years ago or a year ago even, really seriously decarbonizing, and he hasn't. Right. I'll believe it when I see it. If you don't get what you desire from this conference in terms of positive action, what would be your next, you know, protocol? I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm a Christian. Uh, we've walked, I've walked 500 miles to get here. I walked from Parliament Square in London. Really? On the Camino to Cobb. You walked from London? I've walked from London. It was a well pilgrimage done. because we, there, as alongside action, actual prayer, contemplation, meditation, people of faith and no faith. We believe that putting our intentions out there and being as caring as we can is the way forward. And what we were partly doing on the Camino was to model community as it might be in the future. And that's the other thing. Everything I do is working towards not just my own, reducing my own carbon footprint obviously, but we're all in, complicit in the system. <laughs> but it's to do with building community, love and respect amongst people, uh, which is the heart of Extinction Rebellion, as the heart of Christian climate action that I'm part of. And so everything that we do is to build honesty, truth, care, looking after the vulnerable. And 
if that's the way forward well that is the way forward so I'll be doing that and more of the same mm -hmm. I don't know what form my protest will take but I'm willing to be arrested if need be but it's just a question of what what's the sensible thing to do with it mm -hmm. all right so do you think that climate change is perhaps God's punishment on mankind for our greed no I believe that we have brought it on ourselves it's our own actions that have caused and the sad thing is that the countries which have been most in, complicit in uh, in <laughs> using fossil fuels are the ones that are now living a wonderfully rich and varied life and the people who are at the sharp end of climate change are the ones who are dying because they can't plant their harvests mm -hmm. and this is not fair and we've known this for 30 years uh, we've done nothing about it so I don't believe it's God's punishment and the other thing I believe is that Jesus came to show us what God was like but he suffered alongside people he didn't magic things, and I don't believe God will magic anything. I think God will walk alongside us through the pain and the suffering that we're about to go through, I'm sorry to say. And I'm really pleased to see you here today interviewing Thank you, thank you. It's, 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 been a, it's, it's been a pleasure getting some questions in. We appreciate you guys' responses, and uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you very thank much. God bless. Hi, I'm here with uh, Gillian McKay, our Green, Green MSP for uh, Central Scotland, and uh, I'm very happy to be doing the interview with you today. Very happy to be here, thank you for having me. No bother, uh, should we just fire into the questions then? Yep. Right. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be going first. Uh, what do you think is the importance of COP this year? The importance of COP this time round is it's really our best and last chance to keep um, climate warming under 1.5 degrees. We've heard so much from young people about how important this is. We are stewards of the planet and we need to hand it on in the best um, in the best condition we can. So this really is the point where we have to impress on global leaders so much that this is our last and best chance to keep um, the planet in a state that will be habitable and live in it, thrive in it. And we're already seeing how the climate is breaking down in various parts of the world, in the global south, um, and they are the least able to to adapt and and recover from um, any adverse climate uh, events in their area. Thank you. Uh, is your party considering low emission zone policies for big cities like Glasgow and Edinburgh, for example, uh, Sadiq Khan's policy in London? So we've advocated low emission zones for quite a long time, but mm -hmm. they are only part of the solution. We've seen during um, the pandemic that a lot of the commuter routes, um, St John's Road in Edinburgh, Paisley Road West in, in Glasgow and things that while people were working from home, the emissions in those areas went down a lot. Um, but in more local areas, for example, I'm from Falkirk, so there's one particular road in Falkirk that the emissions didn't change when people were working from home. And it's really about looking at, as well as low emission zones, to make sure that commuters aren't having an adverse impact on, on areas. We need to look at how that links with better public transport and more um and more environmentally and more environmentally friendly um public transport as well electric buses and things like that to make sure that we're not just displacing those emissions onto onto public transport instead to make sure that we are genuinely improving the air quality in all parts of our towns and cities for everyone uh, one of the key criticisms of such a policy is that uh, it disproportionately affects people who have older cars and consequently those people who have cars that have higher emissions are poor people very often and I know your party is a very big champion of uh, supporting uh, people who are on a lower income so what would you have to say to that? <coughs> I, think that's a very, I think that's actually a very fair criticism of it and I think that's why making public transport affordable is so is so much a part of what we need to do. We need to make sure that this transition away from fossil fuels, which includes transport, obviously, is a just transition. That's partly about taking workers with us, but it's also about making sure that communities like the ones that you've outlined are not left behind, making sure that they have that ability to, to switch to public transport. At the moment, public transport buses and trains are so expensive and are at, will hopefully come, come about in part through the nationalisation of ScotRail and hopefully more locally owned bus companies and locally run bus companies rather than the big monopolies we've got at the moment who are very slow to move on many of the adaptions that we need. Mm -hmm. 
Right, uh, what do you think COP being held in Glasgow does for the country's reputation? I think it puts Scotland on the world stage in the in the way we would all, I certainly would like it to mm-hmm. be. We are a small country, but we have a huge potential in terms of renewable energy. A large proportion of Europe's um, wind power capability, tidal capability, wave capability is all within Scotland. We are one of the countries that is probably best placed to move away from oil and gas, despite the huge... Um, the huge oil and gas industry that there has been in Scotland historically. That also means we're in the best place to move to a just transition, to start getting those workers reskilled that are already very skilled, reskilled into other into other areas that is going to last for longer. We know that oil and gas has to stop. So we know that um, moving these workers into other fields slowly and sustainably is something that is something that's really, really useful and really um, imperative to what we need to do. I think it's also highlighted the strength of feeling within Scottish within the Scottish population of how much they care about the climate, how much they care about their own environment and things like that as well. Because it's not just about the sort of global climate um, issue, but also the biodiversity on a Scottish level our um, marine environment things like that as well. I'm a marine biologist um, and the marine environment is something that I'm really passionate about championing. There's a huge biodiversity in the marine environment and the, the reforestation plans that we've seen um, my ministerial my, one of the Green Ministers Lorna Slater yesterday announced a ban on single use plastics which is going to be transformational to the waste that we see So I think it has highlighted the potential that Scotland has and the potential that we have as a small country to be able to make to make a difference. And I think that really helps the sort of worldwide narrative on climate, that it's not just the big countries that can do something about their emissions. It's the little ones, too. And I think we're right at the front of that. But it also shows that we've got further to go. We need to start making the transition more quickly and we need to start moving on it as soon as possible to make sure that our environment and the global environment is is good for your generation (laughs) to be able to come and live and prosper and hopefully take over my job at some point and make (laughs) good decisions. All right, Uh, now that your party is uh, formally in government, you mentioned uh, earlier Lorna Slater's uh, ban on single-use plastics. What other policies does your party have uh, planned? Oh, so we've got lots. So... um, (coughs) particularly in my portfolio, so I'm our health, social care, sport, women's health and mental health spokesperson, so just just a small amount of government <laughs> policy there. Um, I'm really pleased that we are um, investing in gender identity clinics to make it easier for um, people to go and get gender identity services. We're investing in mental health services to make sure that more people have um, mental health workers in their, in their GP practices to make sure that those with mild to moderate mental health um, issues can get access quickly to the help that they need so that we don't end up with people sitting on waiting lists forever. Um, There's lots around uh, Gender Gender Recognition Act reform. We've got... um, probably going to have to cut this very long (laughs) course um there's there's lots in education ross greer's worked very hard on that side of on that side of uh the agreement we've got um agreements around human rights bills i'm uh i'm also trying to bring forward uh um there's a lot understandably Seeing as we're Greens, there are lots of environmental mm-hmm. um, policies in there, but obviously we don't we don't agree on everything, which is why mm-hmm. actually I think the most exciting bit about the cooperation agreement is the possibility to reach more agreement about more things going forward. I really, and I said this to the party at the time, I really feel like the um, the cooperation agreement is actually a floor for what we can achieve and not the ceiling. Um, there's lots of issues that the cooperation agreement doesn't cover, so there's actually a lot of scope for us to get a lot further. We're really pleased that the Scottish Government have said that 
we need to move, we need to reduce demand on on flights, which is a change in their policy and comes more towards what we would what we would like to see incentivizing trains for all the reasons we've already we've already said over planes there's not there's not many reasons for needing an internal flight within the UK when mm. you can get from Edinburgh to London in four hours. Um, I absolutely understand the lifeline flights on the on the islands and things like that where it, it really is an essential it's as essential as buses in, in Edinburgh and yeah, things yeah. like that. So there's there's lots still to do and the fact that we're only six months in and we've got the agreement we do have, I think it's really exciting going forward and plenty of scope to achieve some really some really good and radical things going forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, does your party see the results of COP26 as satisfactory? So obviously COP hasn't concluded mm-hmm. yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually think we're probably going to be quite disappointed in where we've got to. There's a lot of watering down of some of the of some of the language in it from requiring people to do things to requesting people to do things and the the under two coalition is really good but we actually need that to be under 1.5 mm-hmm. I think that's possibly a recognition by some of the by some of the governments that we maybe haven't moved quickly enough mm-hmm. and under two is probably more realistic now than under 1.5 which is concerning to me because I think we can still push to go that bit faster and that bit quicker um, I think we are not going to get that transformational agreement that we maybe hoped for after Paris and how and how radical that agreement was we're really not I do not think that Glasgow is going to be that next step up from the Paris agreement there are plenty of people trying to water down some of the some of the asks from the Paris agreement and things I may be, this may go out and by Sunday I could be totally wrong and everybody's, <laughs> everybody's gone away taking <coughs> stock and on Saturday they've all, they've all changed their minds and decided we're going to be really radical, but I don't... That's unlikely. It's unlikely, yeah. Personally, I don't see that happening and I think actually what we are going to have to do is, as Scotland, as I said earlier, is actually lead by example and I think that's where, that's where we could really do that and put some other governments to shame with what we could do as a small country compared to the likes of the US who won't commit to ending coal for example and I mean we gave up coal quite mm-hmm. Well speaking of big powers uh, is my next question um, what, what do you make of uh, the leaders of Russia and China not turning up to COP? I think it I think it's a bit of a scalp in the face to the whole to the whole thing really this is supposed to be about international negotiation and coming together to essentially save the planet which is kind of a big deal and should really be taken seriously by all the world by all the world leaders which is probably why the agreement that's going to come out of this is so disappointing because for some of them it does it does show that they are more inclined to bend to the big polluters than they are to actually put the needs of other people in other countries ahead of shareholder profit which is ridiculous <laughs> and it's something that I really I really want to impress upon our own government is that shareholder profit doesn't matter if we can't live in the country we're in in a short, in a short period of time and we're already seeing I mean climate, climate refugees are going to become a thing very very quickly if we don't do something really radical shortly, we're going to see large parts of the globe where we can't where we can't live, and that's not good enough to allow people to take millions and hide it offshore in the Cayman Islands and places like that. It's just it blows my mind how unequal and ridiculous it is. Uh, what do you think has been the most notable pledge from COP? The beyond, I actually think the Beyond Oil and Gas um, Alliance that um, that there was a lot of news about yesterday is actually really interesting. So obviously Wales has joined that. Um, we haven't yet 
I am still hopeful that that might happen. That's probably the bit I'm mo most hopeful about over the next couple of days. I really do hope that we will join that. But those countries who've committed to a future beyond oil and gas is is powerful and and those countries are and I think there's one there's one I think it's Quebec so there's one Canadian state as well that has joined it and obviously they're a devolved administration like we are like Wales is so we could absolutely go and join that and commit to it as well I understand to some extent I understand the nervousness around obviously the oil and gas um industry in Scotland but we do have to indicate really strongly that we are moving away from oil and gas we cannot continue maximum extraction in the North Sea and the fact that clearly the UK government are not going to sign up to it because they are trying to license for Campbell um, and put a big pipeline through marine protected areas which is something I absolutely cannot stand for um, so so yeah there's that's probably the most that's probably the best actual agreement I've seen. I've been really I've been really heartened by some of the themed days as well at COP. Um I thought the the gender day was quite interesting because obviously a lot of world leaders are men and usually white men. <laughs> so there's the fact that we had a whole day dedicated to women in these settings and was was really powerful I think for me given that some of the countries with the most progressive policies on on climate are fronted by are fronted by women so that was I really enjoyed that that sort of themed day as well <coughs> uh, well during the you mentioned the Scotland hasn't signed up to the the oil and gas coalition uh, your party during the 2021 election stood very proudly I add on a a pledge to for a, a second independence referendum now, my knowledge of uh, the last independence referendum won't be too great. You know, I was I was about I was about ten years old yep. at the time. But what I can very uh, vividly remember is that one of the main focal points for independence was that Scotland's economy could run very heavily off the oil and gas in the North Sea. Surely, if uh, that were to happen, that would be a same pledge in NDF too. Would that not be outrageous for your party? It would be, but that's why I think the the capability for us of renewables is so strong the the um the possibility of us being able to manufacture and export wind turbines tidal turbines and all this technology the skills be able to train other countries to maintain these things with the skills transition that we could have from oil and gas i think is actually something that is more likely to sustain a scottish an independent scottish economy than maximum extraction of oil and gas the for no, for more reasons than just the, the climate crisis, we're getting to the point where some of these reserves are more and more difficult to get to, more and more expensive to drill for, and that's, that doesn't make it sustainable. So what I, representing a, a region like this, like my one, we've seen how badly things go when governments do not manage transitions. We saw the collapse of long before any of us and then continually threaten to just get up and leave the site at Grangemouth. Mm -hmm. It's not okay. That's why we need to transition away and why an independent Scotland, I believe, would be better exporting the the fantastic technology, the building skills and the skills to maintain the renewable sector. Mm -hmm. uh, so just as a last question from me, uh, obviously in, in light of COP we all want to try and reduce our carbon footprint um, what have you done uh, in your personal life to help reduce your carbon footprint and what can we take from that? So I am very conscious about where and when I take a car journey obviously Central Scotland Central Scotland's an interesting region because trying to get anywhere obviously I was supposed to be here earlier in the week <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and due to a train being cancelled, didn't make it. Um, but Central Scotland, in terms of actually getting across it as a region on public transport, is actually really difficult without having to go via Glasgow every time. For me to be able to get to from where I am in Falkirk to Motherwell, you have to go into Glasgow on the train, swap to Central, and come back out to Motherwell again. Mm -hmm. 
and actually this is where this is where I think we now that we are in government we have to implement what we preach Mm -hmm. there has to be that real push towards sustainable public transport we've started that by allowing by having free public transport free buses for under 22s that's a start that both gives people the ability to travel for work for school to go and see friends to go and do all that good stuff but it also means that families who are on lower incomes who may not be able to who young people in the family may want to be able to go to college and things like that but if getting there was a barrier if there's no car in the house but bus fares are extortionate it now allows that mobility for these young people which i think is which i very much hope is uh, no longer being under 20 more locally there's a couple of great farm shops through in falkirk that are that are really good for that sort of thing um and just just generally trying to be more conscious of consumption as well like fast fashion is a huge um contributor to uh to emissions and things and places like Primark and all those sorts of th- all those sorts of places who produce things for mass for mass consumption is is really contributing to to overall global emissions and I really think that's probably one of the next areas we need to we need to tackle we've sort of got the low hanging fruit and mm-hmm. done all those make sure everybody recycles and all those sorts of things but we do now need to tackle those sort of those sort of vested interests and things as well I will not take an internal flight in the UK and I will always try and get trains to um, bits of Europe, obviously we've not been there mm-hmm. we've not been there in the mm-hmm. last couple of years <coughs> um, but certainly to, once you get into, once you get onto the continent, the trains mm-hmm. are incredible, it's just getting there that's most of the problem usually because the trains between Edinburgh and London are often so expensive but there's always I single use plastics I try and stay away from as much as humanly possible and if you do have if I do have to use them it's usually something along the lines of vegware um, and things like that I've always got my reusable uh, cutlery with me on its wee carabina so <laughs> it's all, probably all the really stereotypical green things you would think I would say <laughs> um, grow some of my own um, veg and things like that in the in the greenhouse and I've got a grapevine in the greenhouse mm-hmm. so that's lovely for some fruit at the end of the year and things like that as well so yes Good. Now, uh, I'm conscious of the time we've only got around uh, 10 minutes left so just a final question for myself uh, you mentioned the devastating impact that these big industries leaving local communities could have. Now, in the 2021 election, sorry, uh, your party ran on a manifesto of uh, big tax hikes on the rich. Mm-hmm. So could it not be argued that these big tax hikes will perhaps encourage these rich individuals to take themselves and their companies out of the country? I don't think so. I think there's... So there's two things there. So we think that people who are on high incomes, like me, should be paying more tax and I think that's absolutely right we are um, I mean the median pay in Scotland is something around £24,000 MSPs are on more than double that so we can absolutely afford to pay more tax and it's about it's about taxing wealth as well so for I believe that anybody who is getting a Scottish government contract they should be banking in the UK so that they can be taxed appropriately. We shouldn't be giving subsidies to countries that... To so you mentioned the devastating impact of uh, these industries leaving the communities, how devastating an impact that would be. Now, uh, during the 2020, 2021 election, your party ran on quite a strong manifesto of tax hikes. So could it not be said that these strong tax hikes will perhaps encourage these individuals to get up and leave the companies? I don't think so. We, we've seen Scotland obviously has a higher um, tax rate than than in England and we haven't seen everybody warned at the time that, oh, this will see a mass exodus of people who are in the t- higher tax bands to England. That hasn't happened. And the companies who are, who are profiting from these big polluting industries are making millions of pounds. So the tax hikes that we are we are proposing is actually going to tax a very s- is going to take a very small proportion of their wealth. I don't think that's going to be 
something that the likes of the likes of Enios and Amazon and and people like that are actually going to are actually going to get up and leave over. They may threaten it, um, but so far they're, especially in the case of Enios, those threats of those threats have come to nothing. Um, I absolutely believe that those who are on higher income should be paying more tax. I also think that we need to get away from seeing tax as a punitive measure. Taxes pay for schools, pay for healthcare, pay for prescriptions. We don't have prescription charges. We're abolishing dental charges. So all of those things, taxes are paying for all of those things so that they are free at the point of use. And I think that those who, those who can afford to pay more should be to make sure that those who are on lower incomes have the ability to live at a decent standard of living. We also believe there should be a universal basic income to guarantee that minimum standard of living for everybody, to make sure that uh, choices from choices from the Westminster government like the two-child tax limit and the bedroom tax and things like that we can we shouldn't have to mitigate for them we are having to mitigate for them but it means that you could adjust the universal basic income to adapt to those to those changes the scottish government are looking at a minimum income guarantee which is slightly short of where we'd like to be with a universal basic income but it's a good first step with the powers that we actually have we would need more powers from mm-hmm. um, from Westminster to be able to fully implement a universal basic income the way we'd like to see it. So I think we need to stop seeing taxing these people as something that could potentially frighten them away and actually see it as their moral duty to contribute to the communities that they are profiting from. It's not good enough to for Amazon to be creating mass amounts of waste and the communities have to pick up it's our councils that are processing this waste and things it's council tax that your parents will be paying i'm paying that cleans up after amazon's mess so why should they not pay the appropriate amount of tax to contribute to the the systems that they are that they are impacting I'm conscious of time, but just uh, just as on a final note, is there anything you would just like to say as a final note just before we end this? No, just thank you so much for thank you so much for having me. It's great to hear um, young people like yourselves being so engaged with what's going on at Holyrood and what's going on sort of more widely in in politics generally. I think. I was on a panel with um, my colleague Ross Greer yesterday, who said that if you have experience of of schools or any other um, any other public service, then essentially you have you have experience of what politics impacts on. So absolutely keep asking all the difficult questions of people, and hopefully I'll be able to come back another time. Hopefully, it's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed the content within this podcast. I hope you found it somewhat amusing um, and get to listen to the opinions of uh, Argyle Barclay. We've not even heard them yet, so we don't know how controversial they are. Uh, so I guess we'll hear it after the podcast is uh, published. We do have some teachers who have gave their top tips on how to study for exams and uh, prepare in the best way you can. So the first teacher is Miss Jones, and her top tips are that you should realise the stress and anxiety. You should realise that stress and anxiety during exams is perfectly normal. Research shows that you work best in the stress zone where your pulse is slightly raised and palms are slightly sweaty. You should also have a study timetable, Miss Jones says. Make plenty of time for breaks and away from screens. You should also spend time at night in nature for an exam, uh, which is proven to be an, have an impact on your performance. So go a walk, uh, go a run, or if you do a club or whatever, um, yeah, make use of that. That would definitely improve your performance during an exam. We've also got um, some study tips from Miss Buchanan. She says to focus on topics that you're not confident in first. So obviously for me, that would be my parliament versus government essay in modern <laughs> studies. Um, obviously after I got zero marks in one of the oh, well done, paragraphs. Then. Well done. Um, she also says to have a break every 20 minutes, get away from your studying, a wee walk or make yourself a cup of tea. Or if you play FIFA, you know, 
hop on quick game of division rivals oh, in between your studying get yourself uh, angry yeah and then set yourself a realistic target and reward yourself when you reach it so um, that's, that's some good tips yeah that's some good those tips. are some great tips uh opinions of miss todd are you should put your phone away which is something i still struggle to do with uh, this year even being in sixth year so i had my national fives and my hires and i'm doing my advanced hires this year and it's something i've always struggled with um even though mom and dad are always nagging me put your phone down put your phone down i still live with my phone always on snapchat or fifa companion uh yeah i i should probably listen to miss todd here uh so you should also start a study group with your friends miss todd says which is also a good idea because i know for me with some of the subjects i had uh with my friends we studied together which helped each other because you could uh you know give opinions and different <coughs> questions and that so it's definitely a good idea for Miss Todd. I, I'd say I'd recommend that one. Um, now we've got some from Mrs. Bonner. She says that little and often for studying, don't wait until the last minute and cram. Obviously, you don't want to be sitting up till 3 a.m. the night before. That's yeah, something that uh, Louis French would do. Yeah, and then st- staying up all night and then sleeping in right before your exam. Obviously, not a great look. Um, to ask for help, you don't need to do things on your own. All your teachers are there to help. Obviously, if you're struggling with something, your teachers aren't going to bite your face off for asking about it. Just go and get the help you need. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they're if, they're, if they're on they're your there. side. They, as much as you feel like they're not, they want to help you pass your exams. Yeah, exactly. Because it also looks good on them as well. Yeah. Um, attend support study. Obviously, me and Alex had that with our maths with Mr. Payton. Oh, please. They also get free food sometimes, He's, depending on your teacher. Yeah, guess. if your teacher's good enough, they'll bring in some biscuits for you, like Mr. Payton did. I mean, who wouldn't want that? Um... Try not to stress, obviously, you can, if you have anything that keeps you calm, music, meditation, um, just going for a walk as well, all of those things will help you relax and get your mind off of it. You don't want to leave questions out, see if you're on an exam and you don't know what it is, just jot something down, see if you even get mm-hmm. one mark for it, it's a mark one that you mark didn't have. Mark. Exactly guys. Um, and make sure to eat something before you go in for a long exam, which for me would be some chicken and rice, chicken obviously, and rice, best meal. Um, but you don't want to, you know, start getting hungry and con- and lose concentration when you're in yeah, the exam. Exactly. So that would be the worst thing, imagine that. Yeah, Sitting doing it and you're starving. And then we've also got Mister Schooler who says his main advice would be to go see your assessment. Or, uh, can't even <laughs> read. His main advice that he would give would be to see your assessments as something t- to relish and a chance to prove yourself. If you treat them like they're something to be feared, then you may not do as well with that mindset. You will naturally want to either run or just give up. If the assessment becomes the predator, then you become the prey. You need to flip that around and let the assessment become the prey and you become the predator. Once you get into that mindset, everything else, such as studying, becomes easier. Wise words from Mr. School there. I yeah. guess you've got to just uh, face up to your exams. Oh, yeah, God. exactly. Treat it like a fear and just... Say you are scared of heights, would you, you'd stand up on a cliff to get um, round that fear. So exactly. just exactly. face your exams like that. Don't be scared of them, guys. I know they are a scary thing, they're daunting, but just think once they're done, that's it. You don't need to worry about them again. Um, and then after that, it's usually summer holidays, isn't it, Daniel? After yeah, the exams? you it's can relax, brilliant. go to the beach. Portavello, Port obviously, Velo beach. best beach. I know. That is good, definitely. It's a good feeling when your exams are done. So... Um, no, I think some of those tips are definitely worthy of uh, noting, guys, for your, your exams. Um, yeah, I think it would help you improve. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to keep some of them by my side for my exams. I know. I'll definitely try to put my phone away. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Need to uh, maybe have to delete Snapchat or something, but for a wee while, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, let's take on board these tips, guys. Definitely, they are beneficial. Um, but that concludes our... Oh, his, his headphones <laughs> fell off. Um, that concludes the podcast. Yeah, thank you all for tuning in. It's um, been wonderful, wonderful to host it. Um, yeah, it's after a year. What is that? Nearly two years. We've not been able to do anything kind of like this physical. Uh, we just yeah. have doors. It's a good opportunity to do something. I hope uh, students around the school have benefited in some way, shape, or form from this podcast. Or even if you haven't, hope you enjoyed it at least. Um, yeah, learn something new maybe. Yeah, so this podcast will be published next. Is it next Monday now? I think. I think it is. Friday. So, um, so yeah. whenever it comes out, we'll let us know your be feedback. On the Green Falls Twitter. So we hope you enjoy it though. Um, if you get a chance to have a listen, if you're at the gym or maybe if you're studying, you can listen to something like this as well. Yeah, there will be more episodes coming soon. So yeah, um, thank you very much for listening, and we'll 
See you all later. Thank you, guys. Goodbye.